Okay, yeah, no, so thank you, really thank you to Isabel and Matt Red, and also to Njoki and to um, Chow for curating this program. Okay, where's this? This is the mic. Yeah. Okay, so the museum is a plantation. The two are not equivalent, though they share long histories inextricable from colonial expansion, racial capitalism, from primitive accumulation, from dispossession, slavery and indentured labor, from the global translocation of bodies and plants. Museums and plantations are unavoidable, culpable companions. But the museum is a plantation, and I talk specifically about natural history galleries and about the place of nature in museums. So the ways in which visions and imaginaries of nature are constructed, how they're exhibited and disseminated, where they came from, who they came from, and how these forms of museum nature restructure the relations between land, ecologies, and communities outside the galleries. And in turn, how political governance of landscapes, as we were saying earlier, um, of landscapes and communities feed into museums. So plantation logics and museum logics draw through time. They're deeply tied to climate crisis and to planetary upheaval. So my work focuses on the histories and futures of nature in museums in Sarawak. So this is a state in East Malaysia on the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia. Um, this is a map, it's a very old map of forest concessions, <coughs> logging concessions across Sarawak. Um, and just to give you context, it has a very strange colonial history. So it was once under the governance of the Sultanate of Brunei to its north, but then it was ruled as a private kingdom by several generations of an eccentric English family called the Brooks, or they named themselves the White Rajas. Um, and they were strange because they were, it was outside the British Empire, so it was kind of on the periphery. Um, and the Brooks, it ran at a loss. They never made a profit, they refused missionaries, they refused foreign corporations coming in, and they were kind of more benevolent towards indigenous land rights. It's a big generalization, but yeah. Um, then there was the Japanese occupation for four years, and then 20 years as a formal British crown colony. And then Sarawak joined the Federation of Malaysia in 1963, that's where it stays today, um, but many Sarawakians still consider it another form of colonialism. And so with all of these different forms of governance, there's different ways of controlling land, people, and museums. So Sarawak's post-colonial history has been defined by its shifting landscape, so that kind of predictable trajectory from forest to timber logging, mining, damming, monoculture plantations, so usually oil palm. And uh, by the late 1980s, Sarawak was one of the world's biggest producers of tropical hardwoods, and today it's one of the largest exporters of palm oil. And so obviously you have the companions to that, which is dispossession of indigenous land, pollution of rivers, air, soils, extinction, biodiversity loss, everything else. So the Sarawak campaign was a series of events between the late 1980s and the mid-1990s, which began with nomadic Penan communities in the Baram region of Sarawak. And they had erected blockades against logging trucks encroaching on their forests. It swiftly transformed into a very high-profile environmental campaign, so it was directing international critical attention towards Sarawak's deforestation practices. Um, and it drew into the fray this kind of wider range, wide, wide array of organizations and people from global and environmental, global environmental indigenous rights NGOs, grassroots activists, politicians, the US Congress, timber companies, and then this strange assortment of supporters from Al Gore to Prince Charles to the Grateful Dead. Um, in response, the Malaysian government launched a furious PR campaign against what they framed as eco-imperialism by the global north. And these events have been analyzed extensively elsewhere. So for this reason, I don't really want to replicate the frontal images from the campaign of indigenous communities standing in front of bulldozers. Um, instead, these are details from a series of government-backed pro-logging newspaper reports, which demonize indigenous forest use and shifting cultivation. So I want to focus on a series of statements issued by Malaysian government officials around this period. So former Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir bin Mohammed says, the Penans are not a showpiece, neither are they there for the Europeans to do their anthropological thesis on, they need to live like human beings. We've got the Ministry of Primary Industries in 1992. It is high time environmentalists treat Penans as humans and not as part of the biodiversity. Adan Mahathir again, environmentalists want the Penan to remain forest people. They want the Penans to be a museum piece so they can come and look at the last of the cavemen. The Penans are a discovery for them to use as an excuse to pressure a small country. We all know that the environment has been polluted by advanced countries, not Malaysia. 
So the repercussions from these confrontations were felt across the board. It reframed the terms of debate for global South governments who were looking for kind of excuses to justify large-scale extraction. But it also significantly impacted on how Western environmental organizations, so Greenpe Greenpeace, WWF, how they position their own campaigns and kind of acknowledge their own colonizing practices. But the quotes also signal a quieter but no less significant reorientation. So we might understand it as a kind of ontological violence. Within the government's rhetoric was an attempt to strategically clarify a national position on nature itself. So Mahathir's comments repeatedly entangled questions of colonialism, extraction, environmental degradation with the institutions of Western modernity, museums, anthropology, the impulse to visually showcase and preserve. But at the same time, these statements redeployed the foundational binaries of that modernity. So nature versus culture, human versus animals, civilization versus biodiversity. And these are the binaries that obviously originally came from museums and their associated disciplines. But the binaries this time are retooled in support of post-colonial development against the colonizing tendencies of the global north. So there's this kind of twist in colonial, post-colonial rhetoric. And in the process of doing this, the Malaysian government was separating Penan communities from their own ecologies, from their genealogical forests. Um, and it marked a significant rupture. So it affected not only global environmental politics, but also the organization of nature within museums in Sarawak. Plantations are, as anthropologist Arturo Escobar describes, the most effective means for the ontological occupation and ultimate erasure of local relational worlds. For anthropologist Anna Singh, describing oil palm plantations in Kalimantan, so just next door to Sarawak, Plantations are machines of replication. There are ecologies devoted to production of the same. And yet everywhere they depend on local conditions, on vernacular local histories, they are negotiated on a kind of case-by-case -case basis. And these statements also apply to natural history museums. So both institutions can be considered ontological machines. They're engaged in constant processes of inclusion and exclusion of what and who gets counted as nature, who acts as spokesperson for it. And in doing so, they make cuts. So they excise some relations and they establish others. It's a gesture of either or. In this sense, they closely guard reality, right? So whose realities, whose sciences, whose practices, whose bodies and relations count? In Malaysia, these plantation museum histories straddle the colonial and post-colonial moment precisely. So they're woven into the founding of the nation state. And some of the links are very straightforward. So seedlings of rubber and oil palm were nurtured in museum grounds in colonial Singapore and Malaya. Inside museums, economic botany galleries promoted new crops and agricultural techniques to the public. And zoology exhibits kind of taught us this clear line between nature and culture. It teaches people a certain way of looking and engaging with non-human animal bodies. But for Malaysia, these histories are also inseparable from a wider context that entangles the politicization and strategic militarization of forests. So the stories of insurgency and counterinsurgency, colonialism and anti-colonialism, plantations and museums. Museums have provided cover for colonial anthropologists whose work results in the dispossession and relocation of indigenous forest communities. Money for covert warfare has been channeled through museum as funding for the arts. These stories are too big to cover here, but the lines between these kinds of institutions blur very easily. One bleeds into another. So this is a sprawling room-size miniature diorama at the Forestry Museum. So this is housed inside the Sarawak Timber Industry Development Corporation. The museum opened in 1987, so this is just as the Sarawak campaign is beginning, and it was an attempt to publicly rebrand and legitimize the timber industry. And so the diorama gives you this overview of Sarawak's coastlines and forests. And as you walk up, you have a choice of two buttons, English and Malay. You press a button and a narration and a light show begins. And so I quote from the narration, the natural vegetation of Sarawak is evergreen tropical rainforest. For centuries, its people have lived off of the rich ecosystem, which has yielded infinite materials for food, shelter, clothing, and ritualistic implements. Mixed dipterocarp forest, which covers a large hilly part of Sarawak, has a deep, dense leaf canopy that reaches a height of 35 to 55 meters. The dipterocarp tree family, such as Maranti, Kapor, Kruing, and Selangan Batu, constitutes the most important commercial timber resources. And so as this narration goes, spotlights move across the span of the landscape, highlighting tiny oil palm plantations and tiny timber logging camps. There's a tiny heli logging copter <laughs> lifting a tiny log clear of the interior forest. And then down the river to the coasts where 
these tiny little barges drag away tiny bundles of logs. So it's mass extraction on this vast miniature scale. And the landscape is unti entirely unpopulated. There's no human or animal figure anywhere in this. Um, it's a kind of museum terra nullius, right? There's strategically empty land. There's only trees and machinery. But in the center of so much industry, there's this neat little hill of scorched earth. It's blacker than any surrounding land use. Felled trees, dead logs, it's an ugly mess, purposefully an ugly mess. And it's labeled Britannian Pinda, so shifting cultivation, indigenous slash and burn agriculture, the enemy number one of the timber industry. So, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to museum staff because it's where you find the inconsistencies in institutions. Um, and the office staff, and it was the office staff, not a design team, who were responsible for making this, they were very enthusiastic in explaining how they painstakingly constructed these little boats, how they sculpted the landscape from papier mache, and devised this mix of glue and curry powder to get the right tone for Sarawak's famously red soil. Shortly after the museum opened in 1987, foreign environmental activists glued themselves to its doors in protest. So Museum Alam Samulajadi, Natural History Museum. In Malay, the word alam means nature, realm, or world. So amphibians are haiwandua alam, animals of two worlds, water and land. Alam maya is a virtual space, so like the internet. Spirits and other non-biological beings can be said to be in another alam. But alam overlap, they intersect, they fade into one another, their boundaries are porous. Alam can be understood as bound to an individual, shared by speakers of the same language, or experienced across species. Alam is inherently plural. It implies a multiplicity of worlds, a multiplicity of natures. In their models of enclosure, reproduction, and a reliance on a specific kind of labor, industrial plantations require a single controllable alam in order to function, monoculture. It is the alam, maybe we could understand it, of capitalism. The plantation, like the museum, is a kind of fort. So it's predicated on European logics of containment, replicability, a stability of space, time, but also alam. And nature in this context is what sociologist John Law calls a one world world, of multiple realities assimilated to a single vision, so implemented through the agrologics of plantations or the techno-aesthetic scientific practices of museum galleries. Both produce and rely on the same kind of nature. Monoculture relies on the same kind of tree again and again. But mononature, mononaturalism, is a single way of understanding nature. You know, and it's kind of just to add in, Malaysia's got this very problematic narrative of multiculturalism. So it's a very diverse country, but it promotes its multiculturalism almost as a kind of tourism factor. It's inherited from British colonialism, but in the background of that multiculturalism is a mononaturalism. It's a single nature, it's a very stable nature. And pushed to the side are the complex relations that tangle human and other than human life forms and their practices with land and seascapes across multiple alarms. So in museums, as local sciences and knowledges are relegated to the ethnography galleries, the tangible non-human realm becomes the territory of science, natural science. Anything that falls beyond these limits is irrational, unnatural, unscientific. It becomes a belief rather than a reality. And therefore, it's much more easily denied a political stake. It's denied a political voice. So in 1990, in the midst of the Sarawak campaign, the Sarawak Museum undergoes a renovation to install a new air conditioning system. So it's very mundane. A mundane reason is always the good reason. Um, and until that point, the zoology galleries, so this is the mammals gallery at the Sarawak Museum in 2017. Um, so until that point, the zoology galleries had remained a legacy of the, its two previous curators. So Tom Harrison, who was a British polymath, who was the final colonial curator, and Benedict Sandin, who was an Iban anthropologist and the first indigenous curator of the post-independence period. So between those two, so between the 1950s and the 1970s, the museum transformed into something extraordinary. So on the left is 1950s, the mammal gallery of the sun bear and leopard cat. And by 1962, you can see that same showcase on the left, and this is what it looked like. So it just kind of exploded into this slightly un uncontrollable thing. Um, and at that point, the museum was often called the finest in Southeast Asia. So on the one hand, it was a very archetypal colonial museum. And on the other hand, it was wildly experimental. It was kind of anti-colonial in a lot of ways. But I'll come back to that. Um, the 1990s renovation marked a return, just as the government and the prime minister was doing at the same moment, to this much neater colonial vision of nature. Um, so we can maybe see it as a coloniality of nature harnessed in the service of post-colonial extraction. 
It's like a museum within a museum, people always say about the Sarawak Museum zoology galleries. So the museum had been stripped back to its original floor plan. There's natural history on the ground floor, ethnography on the first floor. So that's kind of very foundational nature culture split. Um, the Victorian showcases were made in the 1890s in London, so the animal bodies were shipped 7,000 miles, prepared for display, shipped back in glass cases, with this idea of what a British taxidermist imagined Borneo to look like. Um, you know, so you have the orangutan showcases, the proboscis monkey showcases, the leaf monkeys, the wildcats, the sun bear, the bats and civets, the bantang, the shorebirds, the hornbills, the pheasants, each bounded in their own glass case. I imagine the museum as an archipelago, writes Martinican thinker and poet Edward Glisson. It is not a continent, but an archipelago. We must multiply the number of worlds inside the museum. So Glissant draws parallels frequently between plantations and what he calls continental thinking. So this is the thinking that he understood as emerging from continents, looking at Europe. Um, you know, it's a thinking that tends towards bounded forms. So linearities, binaries, unity, coherence, a preference for universals and for certainties. Museums and their disciplines require a certain transparency, so things must be revealed and defined so that they can be measured, compared, contained, and explained. In contrast, the thinking that emerges from archipelagos, so from islands and the spaces between islands, from the fluvial, from the marine, they offer a different rhythm of holding circulations and traces, of the movements and relations of humans and other than humans, and with them, this relentless exchange of ideas, bodies, technologies, and beings through space and time. And so from Sarawak, from within the Malay archipelago, the tensions between archipelagic and continental forms in the Sarawak Museum, they twist and turn. The plantation stutters its rhythm of mechanism and regulation. The museum drifts slowly. It's glacial, produces a slower rhythm, no less insistent, and it's perfectly in time. Tom Harrison was killed by a teak log in 1976 after the vehicle he was traveling in crashed into the back of a logging truck just outside Bangkok. With so much of his life taking place in tropical Southeast Asian forests, so as ornithologist, researcher, British military operative, museum curator, and government ethnologist, so very colonial positions, it was a particularly ironic and violent end. Several weeks prior to his death, he had spoken in Kuala Lumpur against creeping deforestation across Malaysia. So it seems, I mean, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive to highlight a white male middle-class colonial officer in this context of kind of talking about nature and anti-colonialism, anti but Harrison was an interesting figure. So he'd made a career in the pocket of empire, but he was regarded everywhere as anti-colonial, anti-establishment. Um, he was a very antagonistic, disruptive presence in colonial institutions and wrote frequently and very early on condemnations of missionaries, colonial government, blackbirding and the slave trade, timber extraction. And through his uh, career, he was... Uh, very active in his support for indigenous lifeways. These videos are meant to loop, never mind. Um, so his curatorship spanned a period of time where the British colonial administration was quickly overturning land codes, speeding up this development, development for infrastructure for timber and oil palm plantations to come in. New technologies, caterpillar tractors, were finding new ways to cut on hilly terrain, and the international timber trade was booming. So perched on this precipice of mass extraction, Harrison started to transform the museum into this kind of experiment, this cosmopolitical experiment, a refusal to restrict Sarawak to monoculture. As a curator, he actively platformed local and indigenous co uh, contributions to the museum. He engaged indigenous artists, co-created exhibitions with museum staff. And by the 1950s, the Sarawak Museum Journal, which was distributed internationally, was publishing research articles by Sarawakian and local not just researchers, but by museum staff, alongside Western scientists. And they published in indigenous languages as well as English and Malay. So that's Gaon Anak Sureng and TK Budin, who were both uh, museum collectors and a museum assistant, and they were both publishing alongside some of the bigger scientists at the time. Um, and importantly for me, Harrison voiced his frustrations with what he saw as the limit of the colonial imagination, its insistence on universal binary logic, and its rigidly guarded disciplines. So as an ornithologist, he was captivated by what he understood as Bornean ethno-ornithology. So he was fascinated not just by the significance of birds in Sarawakian cosmological life, so birds at that point, before Christianity took over, um, were very important in augury, omens, divination. But they were also, I mean, 
tied in inextricably in daily life, in agriculture, in eating, in marking time, in the regional trade, in bird and bird body parts. Uh, he was also interested in what he called bird philosophies, ornitho ideas, and the agency of birds themselves, how birds and humans live together. And he says, the ordinary Bornean thinks, knows, and cares more about more birds than any Westerner. This is a genuine Bornean ornithology. There's another quote from Harrison. I'm just going to read it quickly. It says, the word animism has commonly been used to describe this sort of belief in this part of the world. I suggest that this is inadequate and in effect derogatory. We are dealing with something deeper, wider, and more imaginative than that. Instead, I propose the term universism, for this system involves conceptions of the whole universe of man, animals, and plants, stars and cloud patterns, sights and sounds and smells, observations, visions, provisions, fantasies, and dreams, with a total effect which is truly philosophical and at times almost beyond the reach of the formerly trained Western mind. And so this kind of rejection of taking, he was taking seriously, very seriously, indigenous philosophies and bringing it into curation, curating the galleries with the assistant curators who were all local Sarawakians. So this is a photograph of the Bird Gallery from 1967. So the showcase has this tableau of the eight hornbill species found in Sarawak, posed around a tree. And above the showcase is the enormous carved head of a Kenya lamb, so the Iban image of the rhinoceros hornbill, Buceros rhinoceros. So you can see the hornbill, the rhinoceros hornbill there. It's the second bird down from the top right, the big black heavy bird. So the rhinoceros hornbill was for the Iban, and I'm quoting Benedict Sandin here, the supreme worldly bird whose, arrival, whose overhead appearance signals the arrival of the deity of war, Sengalang Burung. The rhinoceros hornbill is the state bird of Sarawak while the Kenyalang appears on the state coat of arms. So they're linked, but they're, they don't map completely onto each other. So between the carved Kenyalang and the bird bodies, the space opens up. They come together, but they diverge at the same time. So there's a space between the moment where this kind of, you know, Euro-American Euro ornithology and then Iban bird practices meet over the birds, but they don't meet precisely. And this is what the museum was playing with at that time. On the opposite side of the gallery is the pheasant showcase. So it has a striking specimen of a male Argus pheasant with its wings outstretched, so you can admire its extraordinary plumage. But above the showcase is a six-foot-long carved boat figurehead. And it's not sure, I'm not sure whether it's resting on the ceiling or in, suspended from the ceiling or on the showcase. And it's also not clear what relation it has to the birds, but it would have been fixed to the front of war boats from Ulu upriver communities, so either Kenya or Kayan communities. And across the zoology galleries, the old showcases became pedestals. So they became springboards for more expansive kinds of natures. Um, so you can see there's a case of omen birds in the middle of this table here, surrounded by Kenyalang and other carvings. And then Benedict Sandin walking down the stairs, showing visitors around. And you know, the staircase is this threshold between natural history and ethnography. Upstairs, but upstairs there's a Kenyalang, and he's surrounded by objects that are in other museums would have been split between natural history and ethnography. Here, they're kind of together and there's links between them all. Um, and then in the mammals gallery, there's a turtle display, Turtles Are Not Mammals. Um, it appears sprawling and unbound between two old Victorian showcases. So it spills all over the floor, it's climbing the walls, it's on top of the other showcases. And if you trace the photos through the years, this is changing, ooh, okay. Um, changing year by year, you know, so things come, things go, there's a flag for the Turtle Conservation Board, there's um, offerings tied to the trees to sea spirits, there's a lot of information about the serious scientific work that the museum was doing, so in turtle conservation, and also in the work they were doing negotiating between local Malay coastal populations and local Dayak populations. So multiple alam constantly engaged. Um, there's a human skull inside the porcupine case, um, you know, which at once references archaeological finds, ethological habits, so porcupines drag bones back to their dens to gnaw on for minerals. And it also references indigenous beliefs, so Calabit and Penan associate broken earth and porcupine, porcupine dens with death. So, I mean, this happens again and again, where there's these multiple reference points and multiple things brought together. Um, and then there's, you know, exhibits on regional trade in Swift's Nest and Hornbill Ivory, and then these small dioramas of mining operations with donations from Shell Petroleum. At the top of the staircase, there's murals by Kenya artists from neighboring Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, 
and it depicts the Lepotau tree of life. So right at the top, there's the rhinoceros hornbill. Um, and so all of these things, these kind of rolling exhibits, are gathered under the increasingly elastic definition of natural history. This kind of relentless engagement across multiple alam. It's kind of archipelagic and how it's making links. And in this period, the museum doesn't settle on any single interpretation. You know, it kind of folds again and again. It corrects its mistakes. It takes things away. Um, and the juxtapositions, you know, they remind me a little bit of 1920s, that kind of surrealist movement, anti-colonial surrealist movement in Paris. But where you had Parisian artists trying to juxtapose ethnographic artifacts to try and suggest some idea of universal humanity, the Sarawak Museum was doing something else. It was approaching from the other direction and looking at what happens with experimenting with multiple natures instead. And so the interventions undid any earlier curatorial attempts, any colonial curatorial attempts at presenting a single nature. Um, taking as a starting point the inherited matter of the colonial museum, so the animal bodies, the glass showcases, the ideological binaries, as the raw materials, they chose to follow divergences that came from local thought and practice. Um, and these were brought into the gallery not for any particular ethnic group. You know, Sarawak is very diverse, so it wasn't about Iban, Kenya, Kayan, Shell Petroleum, or anybody else, but it was about ever-shifting relations. So seeing how things come together and on the impossibility of any single interpretation of nature. The exhibit exhibits were never at the expense of the old displays, so that it was not oppositional. It was not about conf it was about confrontation, but not about erasing anything else. It was additive. It was silting layer upon layer, either or, not either or, but and 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 between many different kinds of alam. And in the process, it provincialized Western knowledge. So it's not to excuse the colonial museum's many problematic undertakings through its history. So we have to acknowledge the violence enacted on non-human beings, spiritual objects, human communities, as they've all been kind of pulled apart by museums, um, and also the uneven stakes of participation between colonizer and colonized. But the museum was in this strangely unique place at a very strange time to kind of catch out, to disturb the coloniality of nature from within the belly of the colonial institution. And so the museum is a plantation. The colonial and post-colonial narratives of the museum are not straightforward. They splinter and they contradict. But plantation boundaries and museum boundaries, like imperial and colonial boundaries, are kind of porous, they're leaky. Um, you know, plantations and museums need rigidity. You know, without this, their production requirements wouldn't be met. Um, plantations are machines, so think about any disruption to that system. Pest species, fungal rot that harms trees, changing climate that slows ecological processes and the independent actions of beings within the plantation have the capacity to interrupt. So workers, animals, anything else. Disruptions make the system shudder. They can subvert the continental expectation of total control, total transparency. Um, and just very quickly, I mean, I spoke to a friend this morning and he's a collaborator and he was sort of shouting at me down the phone about saying trees are not the problem. Tree, an individual tree by itself is not the problem. And he's in his village trying to convince his neighbors to plant native trees in between palm oil. So in between their smallholder oil palm stands to plant native trees in order to encourage ecologies to come back. Kind of more functional ecologies. Um, and I think, I mean, just looking at the Sarawak Museum through this history and looking what is possible in those spaces in between, you know, so the moment where things start to break apart, the moment that there's a museum worker who paints something a shade, the wrong shade of red or something, there's, there's potential for slowly kind of prying apart the system to see what happens. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.